Good evening. Welcome to Villa Albertin. I am really happy to introduce our new, our new museum talk uh, dedicated to French art and culture in American museums. Today, we'll have the great pleasure to travel to uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art and discuss the fruitful collaboration on the exhibit Medieval Treasures from the Glencan Museum, uh, which is currently on display at the PMA. For this discussion, we are extremely honored uh, to host Brian Henderson, director of Glencan Museum, Sasha Suda, director and CEO of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Jack Hinton, curator of European decorative arts and sculpture at the PMA, and Michael Coltrane, consultative curator of medieval stained glass at the Glencan Museum. The four of them will be in discussion with our great moderator, Faya Kosei. Uh, Faya is a scholar and educator whose interests range in era from the Paleolithic to the pre present. She started her career as a professor of art history in California and recently retired as the head of academic programs at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Faya's advanced degrees are from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and uh, although her primary field is ancient art and her best known books on amber, uh, she, is also, she has also published on the German modernist Sigmar Polke, Michelangelo, and on Paul Cézanne. Faya, Faya continues to be involved in numerous cultural institutions, serving on local and national boards, among them DC's own Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens and the Archaeological Institute of America. Sasha, Brian, Michael, Jack, and Faya, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I leave you the floor now for these very promising museum talks. Thank you, Denis. Thank you for your kind introduction. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to welcome the audience to this, the 13th in the series of museum talks. Focused on museums in the mid-Atlantic region, those with significant collections or exhibitions of French art. Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a city with special links to France and the Francophone world, a link that has taken shape over several centuries. When it comes to art, Philadelphia's great museums, the Barnes Collection, the Rodin Museum, and where we'll go today, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, are exceptionally rich in their collections of French works, as well as in their history of exhibitions. Today, at the Philadelphia Museum, we're going to go upstairs to a special exhibition of works from the Glencairn Museum. But before that, we're going to get a little tour to the Glencairn Museum itself. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Sasha Suda, the George D. Widener Director and CEO of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I will also mention, just before we go to Sasha, that this one-hour program will have time at the end for your questions. So jot them down in the Q&A, and we will get to them at the end of the talk. And now to Sasha. Sasha oh, there she is. There she is. Sasha was appointed in June 2022 and began her tenure in September. She was born in Toronto to Czech parents and was educated at Princeton, um, Williams College, and in New York. She began her professional career at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where she worked in various capacities, various roles in the medieval department between 2003 and 2011. Then she went to the Art Gallery of Ontario, first as an assistant curator and eventually as curator of European art, and then the Elliott Chair of Prints and Drawings. In these roles, she already began to lead major international exhibition projects and spearheaded innovative digital initiatives that presented historical art to audiences in a new light. And we'll see more of this. Note, with today, with medieval art much on our minds, I'd like to point out that while she was at the Art Gallery of Ontario, she worked on a groundbreaking, acclaimed exhibition, and it was called Small Wonders, Gothic Boxwood Miniatures. And it was a wonderful collaboration with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Before coming to Philadelphia, 
Sasha served as director and CEO of the National Gallery of Canada from 2019 to 2022. Sasha, the stage is yours. Merci, Faya. Bonjour, tout le monde. Bonsoir, tout le monde. Je suis très, très content d'être ici avec vous. And I want to say many, many thanks to the Villa Albertine, to Denis Canel, and to Faya for this warm introduction. I'm here at the PMA. I'm standing in front of a 12th century Romanesque portal, originally from the Abbey Church of Saint Laurent near Sancerre in the Loire Valley of central France. And I'm just happy to be here in a museum that has such an incredible medieval collection and that is working with such wonderful partners with their own incredible collections and institutions and thanking my lucky stars and thinking about the fact that this magnificent stone structure was installed here for the 1931 opening of our medieval galleries and adapted with its two smaller portals to the sides. Its imposing archway offers a dramatic point of entry into the galleries inviting us to discover treasures that range from the 13th century with stained glass roundels from Saint-Chapelle. It's an immersive marble cloister and arcaded walkway from southwestern France with beautiful capitals, reliquaries, and more. The fact is the PMA has one of the largest medieval collections in the country. And in a moment, our curator Jack Hinton will walk you through just a few of the collection's highlights. You'll see how the PMA offers a rich and rewarding context for the exhibition that you'll hear about tonight, Medieval Treasures from the Glencairn Museum, and what a delight it is to display such choice works from Glencairn, which houses one of the world's finest private collections of medieval art. We have the good fortune in our galleries to display numerous precious loans from the Glencairn, almost from the beginning. What a pleasure to learn more about its treasures, to have more of them on view here in the current exhibition, and to have Michael Cothran sharing his insights about them with us tonight. Our thanks to Glen Cairns director, who's on the Zoom with us tonight, Brian Henderson, for this rare opportunity and exceptional collaboration, and again to Villa Albertine for sharing it out to our audiences. Merci bien, et bientôt à Philadelphie, et éventuellement à Bryn Athen. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. Now, um, Brian, we are going to Brian um, at Glencairn, and I just would like to say a few words about him. He served as the director of Glencairn Museum since 2013. Previously, he served as assistant professor of art history and dean of the students at Bryn Athen College, where he taught medieval and American history. As an instructor, Brian made regular use of Glencairn and the architectural art in the collection as an extension of his classroom. In both phases of his career, Brian has been interested in the impact of religion and faith on societal values and structure and on individual human choice. And now we go 19 miles north of Philadelphia. There Thank we go, Brian. you. Thank you, Faya. Uh, thank you to Villa Abertine for hosting this program this evening, for inviting us here. Uh, thank you to Sasha for the warm words. Uh, thank you, Michael and Jack, for introducing us uh, to your galleries and to the exhibition. But let me begin by expressing what an honor it is to be exhibiting works of art from the Glencairn Collection at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And it is quite a privilege to introduce Glencairn Museum to you this evening by sharing just a few words of the story of Glencairn and its collection uh, and the impetus behind the exhibition you will see this evening, ending with a brief visual look at Glencairn itself. To provide geographical context for Glencairn, yes, the museum is located approximately 17 miles from the Philadelphia Museum of Art in the borough of Bryn Athen, just northeast of Philadelphia. Glencairn was designed and built between 1928 and 1939 as a private home for Raymond and Mildred Pitcairn and their children, with the room behind me serving as their living room. Pitcairn originally conceived of Glencairn as a small cloister studio for his growing collection of medieval architectural art, inspired at least in part by George Gray Barnard's original Cloisters Museum. I should note that Pitcairn had not originally set out to amass a private collection, however. 
Instead, he began to acquire stained glass and other works of medieval architectural art in the 1920s as a study collection of inspirational models for the artists and craftsmen who were building a neo-Gothic cathedral for his Swedenborgian Christian community here in Bernathen. As the cathedral project was nearing completion, Pitcairn turned the artists, craftsmen, and laborers in his employ to building Glencairn. Having grown in scale, this nearly 45,000 square foot castle-like home would serve as an immersive space for his collection with medieval architectural arts built into the fabric of the home, as you can see behind me. Pitcairn continued to acquire and collect works of art throughout the 1920s and 1930s, beyond his original medieval interest, to include important works of art from ancient Egypt, the Near East, ancient Greece and Rome, as well as small collections of objects from Asian and Islamic cultures. Glencairn transitioned from home to museum with the opening of Glencairn Museum in 1982. The museum holds a collection of over 8,000 accessioned objects, largely from the Pitcairn collection, including one of the largest and finest collections of medieval architectural arts in the United States, in which is housed 260 panels of medieval stained glass and 350 medieval stone sculptures. Mm. In designing Glencairn, Pitcairn believed that the purpose of architectural arts was to raise our mind to higher, more spiritual things. Today, the museum interprets the works of art in its collection and Glencairn itself as expressions of human faith, with an invitation to experience a sense of wonder about religious traditions around the world, to reflect on the contemporary relevance of a life of faith and on one's own religious beliefs and practices, to build an understanding between people and faiths, and to look to the goodness that is, in present, that is present in all human beings. Last spring, we began a significant infrastructure renewal and repra replacement project that unfortunately necessitated the closing of the museum to the public. To date, we have removed the historic home's original domestic water, electrical, and steam heat systems, dug 27 geothermal wells, and are installing a new HVAC system, all to help preserve and steward Glencairn and the collection for future generations. As we plan this comprehensive project, and knowing that we would have to close the museum for an extended period, Jack Hinton and the Philadelphia Museum were kind enough to entertain the notion of a loan exhibition so that some of the treasures of the Glencairn collection would remain visible and available to the public and to increase awareness of them. I would like to thank Sasha, the Philadelphia Museum of Art and Jack for making this exhibition possible. And in closing, I would like to share just a brief visual sense of Glencairn. And I warmly invite you to come visit us in person when we reopen later this year.
Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> we can hardly wait. And as you already mentioned, it will be open at the end of 2023. Now we're going to go from there to the medieval galleries at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And I'm now going to introduce Jack Hinton. Jack is the Henry P. McElhenney Curator of European Decorative and Arts and Sculpture at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Although he is a specialist in Renaissance decorative arts, his responsibility in the Department of European Decorative Arts and Sculptures range from medieval art and architecture to the early modern period. That's a big portfolio. In addition to the current exhibition of medieval treasures from the Glencairn Museum, we're going to hear about more about those. Um, I want to mention some of uh, Jack's other contributions. He's overseen a, a show of works by the contemporary designers Ronan and Erwin Brolak. His publications are extensive and they range from Renaissance treasures from the Fulk collection focused on the medieval and Renaissance um, masterpieces acquired from Folk's heirs by the museum in 1930. So these 30s were a very important period. Now we're going to turn it over to Jack and it's Jack's show. Thank you, Thaya, and thank you to our friends, uh, the Ambassade de France, merci beaucoup, for uh, supporting us and being here with us today. And also thank you to, to Sasha and to Brian uh, for your introductions as well. And it's really a privilege to be able to share the treasures from the Glencairn Museum with you. And obviously, thank you to all of our viewers for, for attending as well and, and being here with us virtually. Um, but what I also want to share is a sense, a flavor, if you like, of our medieval galleries. Um, so you can get kind of an idea of what really makes them special and distinctive. And also, I'd say, certainly a, a celebration of French medieval art. So behind me um, is a portal uh, from the mid 13th century uh, from a community church in Aumonnier, which is quite near Besançon, or was quite near Besançon. It's more or less demolished. But the community church was part of a commandery of the Knights Hospitallers of St. Anthony, uh, a foundation devoted to looking after individuals who'd been poisoned by ergotrot or ergotism, also known as St. Anthony's fire. So you can see at the top of the portal, perhaps there's a, 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 a Tau cross uh, that represents, represents their order. And then behind us uh, in that gallery, uh, we have a selection of liturgical goldsmith's work and other treasures, including pieces from the Guelph treasure, the treasure of the Dukes of Brunswick, that was brought to America in 1931 for um, what's been described as a wonderful blockbuster exhibition of medieval art and from which many American museums uh, acquired very important pieces of medieval goldsmith's work. So that's some sense of that, but what you can, well, I'm sure what you can sense is the importance of architecture and how it defines our spaces and also narrates our experience of medieval art. This was really fundamental to the way in which these galleries were conceived by the director Fisk Kimball and also by his curator and also later director of the Met Museum, Francis Henry Taylor. And they worked together to acquire at what I can only really describe as an astonishing rate, works of architecture, pieces of architecture to frame these galleries and working with individuals like George Gray Barnard, who we've heard a bit about and we'll hear a bit about again, um, in order to achieve these galleries and open them in March uh, of 1931. One of their, um, I suppose once they arrived at that moment of having these galleries, one of the interesting issues is that at that moment, we, we didn't actually have that much in terms of collections of medieval art. Uh, so their strategy for the opening of these spaces was, as I said, to borrow things from the Guelph treasure, uh, which had been brought here by a consortium of dealers, and also to borrow objects from uh, JP Morgan, from another dealer called Joseph Brummer, from George Gray Barnard. But most importantly, uh, we had, even at that moment, loans from Mr. Pitcairn, just as he was really starting the process, or I guess he was a few years into the process of building his house, Glencairn. So Mr. Pitcairn was a very, very important lender for us and um, was happy to put in the museum, I think it was around half a hundred uh, works of art uh, that we had on view here. And in fact, some have, have been on view uh, ever, sent, ever since. So we're, so we're nearing a centenary. 
and I'm standing next to one of them. So this is um, a figure of St. Michael vanquishing the Antichrist or possibly St. George uh, defeating the dragon. I think the jury is out on that. Um, probably made in Burgundy um, in the late 15th century. And in fact, the armor is so meticulously observed um, what we can tell from the depiction of the, of the plate armor and also the rounded uh, feet, the sabaton, I think that's right, um, at, at the bottom um, is that it, it, it should date to around 1490 uh, or so. So showing a really uh, strong interest in um, showing the details of, of the armor and how it's constructed even down to the uh, leather straps that holds the plates together. It's a really fascinating piece. And as I say, it's been here from Glen Ken ever since 1931. Next to it in the window here, you can see an achievement of arms of heraldic pieces of stained glass. So a kind of contrast to the narrative pieces that Michael Cothan will be sharing with you, but they're also important in this period as a way of denoting rank, um, allegiance or, or other um, meaningfully symbolic um, ideas in medieval society. The arrangement here is kind of evocation of an achievement of arms that you might encounter in English a uh, country church or chapel in a castle, um, likely built by uh, a knight, by a member of the aristocracy. So you see, even though they're English, we do have the arms of France there. I suppose that's, that could be a point of contention. Um, but behind us, you can also see the city of Philadelphia. And I, I always love this view, this layering of, of history and time and meaning. I think it's something so powerful and, and really tells us what, what, we, what museums do and what museums are for. But what we also represent here are, in some, to some degree, the medieval estates of society. So those who, uh, those who work, laborers, because we have city and guild coats of arms, those who prayed, because we have coats of arms of the clergy, and then those who fought the martial arms of, of the knights. So the idea of um, the importance of, of knights as members of the aristocracy is something that was already established in the 13th century. I just want to share with you one highlight um, from our collection from this period, from the 1230s. So this is one of the earliest uh, surviving um, military tomb figures from this period. And it shows a French, a French knight um, wearing padded armor and chain mail and this long, uh, long shield, which in 1230 actually was a bit antiquated in terms of its design, but the armor um, is definitely appropriate for the period. And it shows him in this idealized form as of how he would hope to be resurrected. But you can see on the shield, this escabuncle, this, is, this was a functional element to protect and strengthen the shield that eventually became a heraldic charge. And we see around it, these birds, they're actually um, um, charges from a coat of arms, but a very early idea of what coats of arms would be before this is kind of codified. So they're known as canting arms or, or, or canting charges. And these are known as merlet. And the idea is that Merlet perhaps evoked the name uh, of this individual. We think it may have been Fouque du Mel, who was um, a marshal of, of the King of France, a very important soldier, a military man who founded uh, the priory in which this tomb figure was located in Normandy um, in the late 12th century. Um, and this piece was uh, acquired by George Gray Barnard and then later came to the museum. Above it, we have a wonderfully powerfully moving uh, 13th century or 14th century, somewhere in between there, uh, crucifixion, uh, which is another Glen Cairn object, another Pitt Cairn piece uh, that's been on view here continuously, again, since 1931. Now crossing over into our other spaces, I just want to point out to you quickly uh, another, uh, a few highlights again that, that I think helped uh, evoke medieval France rather wonderfully. So this arched portal that comes from the convent of uh, the Grand Carme des Arènes, so the um, Carmelite monastery of the, of the Roman amphitheater that was in Limoges uh, from the mid 13th century. And you can see that it's carved from the, the, the granite, the kind of granite that's, that's typical that you see in Limoges with the Limoges architecture and um, with the cathedral and the Joubet. And then if we come around this way, walking back towards the start of the medieval galleries, uh, this piece is one of the most important um, examples of Netherlandish Gothic sculpture in America. It's uh, a, a Calvary group. Uh, you see crucified Christ here with the angels holding the instruments of the Passion, the Morning Virgin and St. John 
and it would have been placed on a rood. So that's a, a large horizontal beam that separated the nave um, in a church from, uh, from the, you know, where the congregants were with the clergy. Um, and we think it came from the priory of Wanyi in Belgium, which is near Namur. And um, Wanyi is also famous for being um, the site of work of Hugo of Wanyi, a famous um, ecclesiastical uh, um, metalwork from Goldsmith. Um, and uh, what's really wonderful ab about this group, well, I think it was carved in, in Brussels or in Amur around 1500, um, is also you have, again, this wonderful telescoping effect that's so characteristic of our galleries, the vista, where you can view through this, you know, emotionally, um, the emotional treatment, the naturalism of the Gothic sculpture, all the way through to a painting by Roger van der Weyden of the same subject, another extremely important piece of late 15th century Netherlandish painting. Now, heading back over this way, I'll finally, I'm sorry, because I, I love sharing our galleries, but I'll finally get you into um, our special presentation of medieval treasures from the Glen Cairn Museum. And you can imagine what a treat it was for me uh, to be asked by Brian, who, you know, who says I'm very kind to put on this exhibition, but I think Glen Cairn have been very kind of very generous to lend us their treasures. But if you can imagine being able to select from Glen Cairn's amazing holdings of stone sculpture, and stained glass in order to present them here. And also I think really as a, a mark of a long lasting partnership and to continue that, that partnership in that way um, is very powerful and meaningful to me. Now, I'd love to talk about all of these objects and, and uh, you know, I really, I, I do truly love them passionately, um, but I can just tell you instead a few things. So one of the goals here was to really be selective with the most important pieces that, that could convey most, most meaningfully the kinds of things you might encounter at Glen Cairns, I think especially about stained glass and stone sculpture, but also to highlight smaller works that, well, they are important and they're well published, but otherwise you, you, you might have missed or we here are perhaps showing them in a slightly different way. So in this vitrine, we have a, a wonderful enigmatic ivory casket from around the year 1000, made in Northern Spain. Um, I think it was a very, very rare survivor from of early Christian art in Spain. Um, it uh, has scenes uh, from the Book of Kings, the story of King Solomon. And the imagery in general is really about the idea of kingship and good kingship that, that Solomon was held to be. Um, it's believed that this object was used to contain holy oil and that may have been used um, in a ritual of anointing a king, hence the relationship. On the other side, is uh, a fragment of a sculpture ahead of a king that's been connected to the portal of Saint Lazare in our time in France and Burgundy. Um, that well, it depends on where you stand in, in the in the literature, the geography, um, but has often been associated with a, um, uh, the name of Gislebertus, who has his name on the portal. Um, whether or not he's the artist or the patron, we're not sure, but uh, it's still a, a remarkable work from around 1130. And then finally. I'd just like to share with you um, one of my favorite works at Glen Cairn, this capital that's from the upper cloister at saint guillaume le Désert, so a monastery uh, near Montpellier in France. It was founded in about 800 by William of Toulouse, who was a, a member of the court of Charlemagne. Um, but what I think is just amazing, and what I, what I just love to, to, to see in this work is just the amazing level of artistry of the medieval sculptor who made it. We don't know their name, if you look at this work, you can see the incredible, astonishing virtuosic undercutting, the foliage that's all intertwined together with the figures. Um, and for me, this is an object that's just you know, so powerful and so evocative. It makes you look, it looks as if it's cast from metal rather than carved from stone. So anyway, um, I'm going to stop here, but to hear more about Lincoln's treasures, especially if it's stained glass, I'm delighted to be handing over to Michael Cothran. Thanks so much. Jack, thank you very much for that. And um, it just makes me want to be right there looking with your eyes at the objects that you selected for us. Um, we've had some recent um, ads to our group listening today. So in case you weren't here at the beginning, I just want to point out that if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box and we will have time at the end to answer the questions. It's now I'm going to um, uh, we're going to go to Michael Cothran, um, who is the specialist for us today on stained glass. 
Michael W. Cothran is the Scheuer Family Professor Emeritus of Humanities at Swarthmore College, where he taught art history from 1978 to 2017. Since 1994, however, he's been consultative curator of medieval stained glass at the Glencairn Museum. The extraordinary works in this collection had already been the center of his research and publication going back to the 1970s. To say the least, he's familiar with them. His publications are extensive, and I'll just name a few. A book on the stained glass windows of the Cathedral of Beauvais, notable articles on the windows of the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, and the Belle Verrière of the Cathedral of Rouen. That's just a bit. Currently, he's writing a catalog of the medieval stained glass at Glencairn as part of the International Corpus Vitriarum project. And now it's time to turn it over to Michael to take us close and personal to the glass. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Faya. Um, I wanna begin by saying that when visitors enter this um, jewel box of a gallery full of masterpieces of medieval art, they face a wall, the wall behind me, which displays five panels of stained glass, narrative stained glass that came from larger stories and made their way into this collection. This is extremely appropriate because stained glass was a major medium of storytelling during the 12th and 13th centuries. Stories that were already known and cherished by the people who were intended to look at them. It's a misconception that's often repeated that visual narrative in the Middle Ages was intended to be a substitute for the reading of stories by people who didn't, who weren't illiterate, who didn't ha couldn't read words. Nothing could be further from the case. The people who saw these windows knew these stories knew them well, or they were accompanied by a guide who would tell them the basic um, parts of the story before they started. It's tempting, very tempting for me to spend the time I have with you not very long and go through these five panels and tell you about the stories that each of them tells. But I've decided instead to focus more closely on three panels in this gallery chosen for three very different reasons. And the first panel is the one right here uh, next to me, um, which is chosen because it is so important. This may be the most important panel of French medieval stained glass in America. Some people would argue with me about that. It's certainly the most important panel in the Glencairn Museum collection. And since we're in uh, this theme of the 1930s, Raymond Pitcairn purchased it in 19. 32. It's important because it was a part of the glazing of the program of stained glass windows that were created for a church that the Abbot Suger constructed just north of Paris in the 1130s and the 1140s, a church which during the 1140s used stained glass windows as an integral part of an architectural interior for the first time. For this reason, many people consider this the first Gothic church. The notion that stone could be replaced with glass, which requires very sophisticated engineering, may have happened in this place. The windows that Suger put into Saint-Denis were taken out of the abbey at the end of the 18th century um, during the, um, the French Revolution, and they're now dispersed in panels here and there, as well as a few panels that remain in the Abbey itself. But this panel at Glencairn is the best preserved of all of those panels, especially the ones that have been have remained um, exposed to weather and, and um, chemical corrosion over time. This window was actually showcased in the Axial Virgin Chapel at Saint-Denis in the 1140s, and Abbot Suger himself appears 
as a supplicant and pet patron at the bottom of the window. So it was a window that was very dear to him. It's a part of a window, may as well tell you its subject matter. Many of you probably have recognized it as the medieval observers would have recognized it. It's, the, it's an episode from the story of the early life of Jesus, um, a window that's dedicated to the incarnation, to the appearance of Jesus on earth. And some of you may have recognized that this is the flight into Egypt, um, the scene where Jesus and his family escape the potential of being killed by King Herod and go into Egypt to seek refuge. If you look carefully at this, there may be a detail here that not everyone is familiar with. If you look at the figure of the Virgin Mary, who sits on the donkey with Jesus in her lap, her left hand is highlighted in the window. In fact, highlighted in such a way that it would have been visible from the floor. This is not a very large space. And she is plucking a date from a palm tree that bends over to accommodate her grasp. It's a detail that identifies the source of this window as not one of the canonical gospel accounts of the birth of Jesus, but as a, a, an apocryphal account by someone we refer to as Pseudo-Matthew. Pseudo-Matthew says that on the way to Egypt, the Virgin became hungry um, and asked Joseph if he would pick some of the dates from the palm trees so she could eat them. Joseph, we might be able to imagine the tone, explained that he was not able to get up there to pick those dates, and the baby Jesus commands the tree to bend down so his mother can pick the dates. The interesting thing about this, uh, it's, an, it's an episode that only appears in Pseudo Matthew's account, and other details of this window um, also came from Pseudo Matthew's account. And this is not unusual. This kind of scholarly, bookish storytelling is not unusual in monastic churches um, during this period. Um, in cathedral churches, the stories were more straightforward and easy to understand. And then I, that leads me to my second panel that I'd like to concentrate on, which is right next to the flight into Egypt. It's the panel next door. And if you could see both of them at the same time, you'd notice something that, that really was quite striking when this exhibition was put up of the scale difference between these two. The scene from Saint Denis is detailed, intricate. The painting is extraordinarily detailed. The, the, the scene from, from the Cathedral of Rouen, which is where this panel comes from, is bolder, larger, easier to see. Makes sense because it's in a cathedral church. The expansive naves of cathedrals held stories in stained glass that had to be read from further down. The smaller monastic church that Sugier glazed is more intimate. These windows actually could be seen. The detail in these windows could actually be seen from the ground. And there, those details are bolder in my second panel so that they can be seen as well. This is a scene not from a Bible story, but from the legend of the seven sleepers of Ephesus, seven saints who were traveling with the Emperor Dacius, ended up in Ephesus, where the followers of Dacius, these seven, were converted to Christianity and refused to sacrifice to the cult of the emperor and were condemned to death. What happened to them is that they escaped, found refuge in a cave, and centuries later, when the cave opening was uncovered, they woke up miraculously feeling as if they had just had a night's sleep. Malchus, the main, um, the leader of this group, is the person in this scene, you would have known this instantly because of his halo. He's at the back. Look at his face. You can tell from the expression on his face that he is not happy. He's upset. This window was painted at the very first years of the 13th century at a time when artists were interested in empathetic human narrative, 
in figures that expressed the way they were feeling and thinking at the time, whereas the window at Saint-Denis was created at an earlier moment, which was interested in other things. <laughs> in addition to the facial quality here, I want you to notice the way the drapery hangs over the figures in such a way as to suggest the three-dimensionality of the bodies underneath. Another quality associated with the very early period of the 13th century, a period that we often refer to as the year 1200, or uh, Mulden Falkenstiel, um, a German word which points to the way the drapery has, has troughs in the folds. The interest in the solidity of human forms, which makes them easier for the viewer to identify with, is clear by their feet. And I, this is my favorite passage in this particular panel. Nowhere is a foot unsupported by something underneath it. These are not floating figures. These are substantial standing figures. Another thing I want you to notice here is the words at the top. That gives us a clue that this is not an ordinary subject. This is an unusual subject. It needs words to explain what it is. Hic ante presulum ducitur, it says. Here, he, Malchus understood, is brought before the, the prefect and bishop. What's happened is that Malchus has, has wandered out of the cave, gone into Ephesus, gone into a baker's shop to buy bread for his companions and used an antique coin, centuries old. The baker is perplexed and brings him before the authorities because he thinks this is unusual. Malchus explains exactly what has happened, takes the bishop and the prefect back to the cave and everyone celebrates of a miracle that has taken place. One of the, you know, I, I, you can tell probably I love this panel and that's one reason that I chose it. But the reason of my three reasons of the three panels I'm gonna show to you is that this, this scene has a historical context that allows us to date it. The Cathedral of Rouen burned in 1200. And in the early years of the 13th century, after the death of Richard Lionheart, King John, his successor, ruled not only England, but as Duke of Normandy in part of what we now think of as France. And in an attempt to ingratiate himself with his new subjects in Normandy, he gave lavish donations to the reconstruction of the cathedral after it had burned. And specifically, stained glass windows are mentioned. Interestingly enough, the, the, the story of the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus was associated with the English royal cult because Edward the Confessor had dreamed about them one Easter. And so, a saint's lives associated with the English cult, royal cult, appears in the church. Some of you may know that in 1204, John was no longer Duke of Normandy. Philip Augustus swept in and took Normandy as a domain of France. So we know that this window has to have been created between 1200 and 1203, which is extraordinarily precise for a medieval piece of stained glass. I have just a few minutes and I'm gonna to go to, to my panel number three, for which I have chosen something that's a symbol rather than a story. It represents an idea, not an action. It's a panel which was once in the Abbey Church of saint Remy in Rass. And I chose it not because it comes from an important place, even though it does, not because it has stories associated with it, which it does, but because it is incredibly beautiful and astonishingly well-preserved. Most, we're used to looking at medieval stained glass after centuries of damage has cracked some of the materials and there are, and it is zigzagged with repair leads here and there. There is maybe one 
perhaps two repair lead in this panel. There are no cracks. Look at the figure in the middle. The blue background around her has not been marred by cracks. But it gets even more interesting than that. The lead framework that holds glass pieces together to create a stained glass window is usually replaced over time. Most windows have leading systems that have been, um, that may have been the third or fourth leading systems since it was originally made. For reasons that we will probably never know, this panel of stained glass was never re -leaded. So it gives us the opportunity to see how delicate and thin the leading of 12th century stained glass actually was. I always like to say, if you look at the painting on this panel, which is exquisite, and you find the thickest line, you might wanna look at the drapery around uh, in the middle, between the legs of the figure, for instance. It's the same width as the original lead, which means the leading system, rather than an independent framework, is a part of the linear system, a part of the pictorial design. And to have this panel in this kind of a condition made for a very important place by um, artists who gave attention to detail is, is a rare opportunity. And so that's why I've chosen it as my third. I wish I could keep going and talk about the others, but, um, but I'm grateful for this opportunity. Michael, thank you. Well, I think we'd like to hear more from you. And I, we have some questions, both um, probably aimed both at you and Jack. Um, I will just uh, begin with um, um, the simplest one in the sense of um, examples. So we have a question. Are there other examples of such medieval art in the area other than the Philadelphia Museum of Art and Glen Cairn? That's one question. And the other one is um, a, a simpler one, which is when does the exhibition end? So I, I put these two over to you to begin with in answering our questions. Okay, mm -hmm. so they'll be here through October and then there may be a slightly extended run from, for some objects until even the, the new year. Um, so, you know, I mean, definitely come before October and then, and then keep coming. As for other, other treasures, as Faya said, you know, we'll, we'll always have medieval treasures for you to see at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So there's no excuse there, as well as Glen Ken. And there are also places like the Free Library and the Kislak Center at the University of Pennsylvania, which have wonderful uh, manuscripts. Many of those are also published online, and uh, I just off the top of my head, I can't remember the uh, online database for those, but uh, it's a wonderful resource where we can consult uh, scanned copies of the medieval manuscripts. So it's another kind of treasure uh, in the greater Philadelphia area. There are also some wonderful medieval works at the Barnes Museum, too, down the parkway. So come and see us, come and see our friends at the Barnes, and at Glen Penn, Penny Penn. And the library and uh, and spread them out instant. Oh, and uh, well, thank sure. you. I mean, that's not that far anyway. Right? <laughs> All right, now I have um, a couple of questions I think that are specific more to Michael, and one of them is, um, how can you account for the superb condition of that last panel? Um, did you get the question? Okay. Yeah, I did get the question. Okay, okay. I can't, but I, but I can speculate because I love to do that. Um, this was a church. This is this was not the big cathedral church in Rance. This is the the monastic church of Saint Remy in Rance, which is actually I like better than the cathedral. Um, it was a smaller scaled building, though the. It's a 12th century building, which means that the windows, the walls that have the, see if I can make this clear, the, the walls that are punched with windows are thicker. And one of the things that, um, that Suger's architect did um, in the first Gothic church is to move the glass to the inside. If you, put the gla if you put the window at the middle of the depth of the wall, then you see the wall on the inside. 
If you move the window as a membrane to the front of the wall, you have no idea inside the church how thick the wall is. And what that means is that there is a, there's a hood of stone on the outside of the building that protects the window. And I once went around to the back to check that out. And in fact, there are hoods of stone that would have corrected it. On the other hand, there are many windows from Saint Remy. There are many windows from Saint Remy that um, that are, this is extraordinary. So I can't account for it. Best answer. Um, <laughs> I just want to go back to a response that you made. We had someone um, when you mentioned uh, when you mentioned the other place of the library. Um, so the answer is someone questioned what library and the answer is the Free Library of Philadelphia and you also mentioned the Kislak Center at the University of Pennsylvania Library. Um, so this richness in the area is um, a, a marvel, a, yet another marvel um, uh, for Philadelphia. Um, we had a question and I think many people are curious about that but I do want to say one thing that is really important for us is that you, out of all of these things, um, Jack and Michael, that you chose works that had meaning for you that you wanted to share with us. And uh, I think we will probably not ever look at, um, say, <clears throat> an ivory casket or glass the same way. Um, the, someone did ask a question about the, um, the box from Spain. Um, is it specifically Catalonian? Not, not as far as I remember. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Okay, all right. Well, there's a, a range of questions here. And then um, we have a, a larger question, and that has to do, that has to do with moving um, works of art. But I also need to say that we had a comment from someone who says, um, by the way, um, as a New Yorker, I can't help but point out that the Met Cloisters is two hours away by Amtrak and A train. So my many fine medieval works there too. Um, sure. <laughs> of course. <laughs> New York, so. <laughs> okay, our question. All right. We and have a um, relationship with the cloisters, and in fact, you know, our our collection owes a lot to George Gray Barnett, who was you know the, the person behind the cloisters. On the other hand, our architectural walk through time, uh, as we sometimes call it, arguably inspired the cloisters building as as we know it now, as it was as it was built, um, you know, after the purchase of, of, of Barnett's first collection. So that that relationship, you know, we we, we know and, and we care about. But of course, there's there's the, there's the cloisters. There's great things in Washington, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, we've got wonderful medieval things all, all over America that we should right. celebrate. Um, now, one of we have a, a quite a few questions about um, the last piece of stained glass, and that is, um, uh, and it was, does Michael have time to decode the iconography of the last panel? What is the story? who is she or what is she doing why is she blindfolded we just have a couple of minutes but the larger question and i hope there's an opportunity um, to direct people somewhere is um how do you determine the age of stained glass in other words how do we know which parts are original and which parts are modern places um one spins how am i going to put this medieval glass feels and looks very different from modern glass. Um, it, it, it has a different kind of surface and it corrodes because it's potash based rather than soda based. Um, moisture will, uh, will allow it to deteriorate. And it's the deterioration on the back that is often the best clue for the age of the glass. How's that? That's very good. That's very good. And um, it's something, you know, what um, I served a, a long apprenticeship with an extraordinary scholar named Jane Hayward. I'm glad to be able to name her um, in this. She and I came from the cloisters to Glencairn in the 1970s 
um, to catalog the glass together in preparation for an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And she spent those two years teaching me how to make those kinds of decisions without you know, doing chemical analysis of the glass itself. Um, and it had to do with feel and look. Thank you, Michael. We're coming to the end now. And um, I would just like to say one of the questions that everyone is interested in and just shows our engagement with the museum is issues of transport, moving things from one place to another, what is involved. So maybe that will be for another time. So we've come to the end of our hour. It seemed to just go by so quickly. But I wouldn't I don't want to leave without thanking all of the team behind the scenes of this complex program being at two different venues um, in France uh, amongst the um, French team. I would like to thank Manon Simonin, um, the deputy cultural attache and at, the, at Philadelphia. I would like to thank at the PMA Norman Keyes, Laura Coogan, Steve Kiever and Frank Galaviz. And thank you all for this marvelous program. Thank you.